You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Leah Frankie on the show with me. She's got an amazing new book. It's called After the Hurricane. And when you're hearing this, it's available everywhere, and you can go grab your copy today. I know you're going to love this book as much as I did. Welcome to the show, Leah. Thank you so much for having me, Hank. I'm excited to have you. Uh, Leah, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, boy, that is a great question um, and kind of a tough one for me personally. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> I think the first time that I articulated wanting to be a writer was definitely college, which is probably a little late. I think a lot of people um, <laughs> kind of know earlier. Um, but I would say that uh, my original, my, my background or how I got into writing fiction uh, comes from writing theater and from being in theater. And I think that um, my earliest memories of wanting to tell stories probably come from that theatrical background and are probably from the time I was like six years old um, and my mom sent me her very theatrical daughter to theater camp and I just found something incredible about you know audiences responding to storytelling um, so storytelling I think came like came from a theatrical place from like the collective you know sort of performed dramatic story um and that came a lot earlier realizing that for me the best way for me to tell stories would be through writing and then more specifically through fiction came a lot later uh but definitely around six or seven years old my first experience in theater camp in a production of um joseph and the amazing technicolor dream coat was probably the first time i thought like you could tell a story and audiences are or groups of people would, would see it and like respond to it. And that would be a really cool way to spend your life. I think that's my earliest memory. I love that so much. Um, <laughs> the, the, um, I always find it interesting how different artistic pursuits um, have a way of um, crossing over or informing one another. Um, you know, you might think that, that um, stage acting or, you know, working in a theatrical production might not have much to do with with prose writing. Um, but more times than not, I, I've I've found out that that, um, you know, one leads to another or having that experience, then writing prose, you know, you, you pick up certain tools for your toolkit. Um, do, do you feel like that 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 experience in your life kind of has a bleed over into what you do now? Oh, absolutely. Um, and I think that we've become such specialists, which is not a bad thing. But historically, yeah. all of these forms came from the same place. Right. I mean, you know, um, the Homeric Ode and the, you know, Greek tragedy come from the same time period. They're looking at the same ideas. Um, they were both like performed ideas, right? Um, I think that we, um, and historically, like a lot of the historic writers that we've loved do a lot of different things, right? They wrote plays, they wrote books, they wrote essays, they wrote criticism. Um, we've come to a place of like, you know, sort of specialization. And I think that's fantastic because it's so cool to meet a form in its very specific constraints or lack of constraints and look at it. And like, I'm just going to write in this form and I'm going to find stories for this form. I love that. Um, but I think it also kind of blocks us from the amazing ways that we can pull from these different artistic traditions and maybe should be pulling from them to inform and to help us challenge form. Um, 
so for me, my background is theater. I went to my master's is in dramatic writing, uh, film, television and theater. Um, and even when I came into my master's, I had only written plays. I was very theater focused and learning how to write television and film was a great revelation and stretched me and gave me new tools. And I think I brought all of that into writing fiction. I started writing fiction after I completed my master's in dramatic writing. And I'd always read fiction. You know, we're, we're so exposed to fiction and all forms um, in the United States, which is amazing. Um, or we have the potential to be. Um, and it it absolutely has informed my sense of dialogue, my sense of action in story, um, my sense of character as embodiment of desire, and my interest in conflict. I think the dramatic form really celebrates conflict. Um, and what fiction and, you know, or, or um, what sort of narrative fiction or nonfiction narrative can do is give us interior, give us a lot of space without conflict, without um, other people, which is wonderful and like we can embrace as the way to get into a character's head and really live there, um, but can also lead us to inactivity um, and conflict is activity. Uh, so I think that as much as we sort of talk about these as separate forms and they are, they definitely inform each other. They've absolutely informed each other in my life. And I think if we look historically, they've informed each other, right? We don't make art in a vacuum and story forms aren't made in a vacuum. So I always recommend diversity in that way. I love it. Um, I know that you are also a proud Philadelphian and um, I I love to, um, to, to kind of look at how a sense of place um, affects the kind of art that we make. And sometimes it's it's very on the nose and you might write uh, stories, you know, based in Philadelphia and about, you know, informed by people that you knew and, and neighborhoods that you, uh, you know, frequented and, and things like that. And sometimes it's a little more, um, I, I don't want to say ambiguous, that that's not really the word I'm looking for, but not as on the surface. And but it's it's more an attitude of 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 Philadelphia. Um, how do you feel like being a proud Philadelphian works its way into the art that you make? <laughs> I love that question. Um, uh, I haven't <clears throat> really written much about Philadelphia in my in either in any of my three novels. I think my first novel I did. Um, my characters stop in Philadelphia. They're on a tour of the United States. And I and I loved writing about Philadelphia. And I do someday want to write more directly about Philadelphia. Um, but absolutely, I think there is a, um, I think that my sense of uh, place and my sense of urban space has definitely been very defined by growing up in Philadelphia. Um, <clears throat> I really love Philadelphia because I think well, because it's my hometown, um, but also because it's both a his it, it has sort of this amazing um, footprint as a historic city that has been really beautifully preserved. And I, I love that. Um, but it's also sort of a vital and um, current modern city that had this really big renaissance and revival during my lifetime growing up there. Um, I think Philadelphia had kind of really, <clears throat> for a lot of different reasons, gone into a kind of a decline after um you know, for sort of from the 1890s into the into the um, 1980s um, for a lot of different reasons, like loss of industry. And then, you know, there was a sort of big reinvestment in Philadelphia while I was growing up there. And so there's both this kind of really dominant um, preservation of history that's really important aesthetically and also just sort of literally that like informs the city. It's always been really important in American history, um, but also that it is more and more a place that is a current space for people to live and to make art. It's a big theater town, it's a big food town, um, but I think it's done really well in the last like 15, 20 years and it's better incentivizing people to stay. So it's like a, a vibrant US city that also has this really deep historic center. And I think that for me, there was this growing up there, people were really invested in community and there are a lot of different community organizations, neighborhood by neighborhood that were really sort of talking about investing in this neighborhood, investing in this space, you know, neighborhood committees, basically. And my mom was on one, my brother served on one later. Um, I just saw a lot of the ways in which that, you know, people could really change their space by investing in it in like small and very concentrated ways and by focusing on a neighborhood, their neighborhood, and by investing deeply in like loving where you live. That's actually the slogan of my mom's real estate company, love where <laughs> you live. Um, it's trademarked. Um, and I so I think that. 
what that what that maybe made me think about in writing um, and something that I think I have tried to pursue is really writing space in a way that like space as a character right like cities as a character um, and has always attracted me I think to smaller cities or, or more sort of mid-range American cities I, I love New York um, I lived in New York for many years and it was fantastic and I spent uh, six years living in one of the biggest cities in the world, Mumbai, or sort of in the scale of large cities. But I think that mid-sized American cities have this space that is like their human scale. Um, and so they're both this vibrant, diverse urban space that brings people together, that creates encounter, um, and also a place where you can feel historic footprint and feel sort of legacy and a part of something. And so I think that was part of what attracted me in After the Hurricane to writing about Old San Juan, which is another you know, really deep historic city that also has this sort of modern vibrancy that attracts people to it, that has many stages of its existence. Um, I think that's something that probably growing up in Philadelphia kind of affected me to look look for those cities um, or look for that story in other cities, because I'm sure every city has a version of that story. I love that so much. Um, your first novel that you published, America for, Be for Beginners, uh, was that the first novel that you had written? Yes. I started writing America for Beginners. Well, I definitely have like, you know, 40 pages of a of a terrible novel that I, I don't think I can find it anymore. Um, don't that I we all? Don't I we know. Right? It's like sitting in a, it used to be sitting in a desk drawer. Now it's sitting in like, you know, a digital file uh, right. grave somewhere. Um, but uh I, 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 you know, started writing a novel right after my, right after I graduated college, like you do, you know, you're lost. You're like, I guess I'll write a novel. That can't be too hard. <laughs> um, it is really hard and I, it didn't work out. <laughs> uh, but yeah, America for Beginners is definitely the first novel that I wrote, that I, that I finished, that wasn't just sort of like, um, the, the, the desire to say something without really much to say yet. Um, um. <laughs> that I, yeah, I wrote it, I started writing it um, after I f completed my master's uh, in New York. So that was, I think I started that in 2014. And I had this story I'd been thinking about um, and sort of talking about. And uh, the, I, I was, went to uh, NYU for my master's and there had been a lot of the, the culture of the school had been very about, you know, when you want to tell a story, think really seriously about what form will um, best serve the story. Uh, and that had, I think that's a great culture to have. Um, that was like a great question to constantly ask yourself, you know, why does this have to be a screenplay? Why does it have to be a movie? Uh, why does it have to be a, a television show? You know, what what about this, what about this story um, guides it to this form urgently so that it will be best served by that form? And I kept thinking about the story that I had in mind that I had in mind. Um, and, um, uh, it just seemed like it was going to be best as a novel, uh, which was suggested to me um, by my husband at the time. And uh, he was so right. Um, I just, there were so many directions I wanted to take it in. It was something that I knew would live both interior and exterior. It had motion and action, but also a lot of contemplation and um, uh, the thought process of each character was really important to me. And that's something that can be really hard to um, fully flesh out in stories that are about visual action or about um, sort of what comes out, right? Like, like uh, plays are about dialogue, plays are about what comes out of us that then we have to sort of deal with and live in. Um, but what we keep within us can be harder to really show in a dramatic form um, as in as much depth and as much detail as I knew I really wanted this story to include. And I bet a better writer could have done it, but I couldn't. So I was like, I'll write a novel. That'll be fine. Um, a better playwright could have done it better, I'm sure, and put it on stage. But for me, the novel was the form that really felt like it served this. And then as I started writing it, I was like, oh, I love this. I, I, I love writing and I love writing plays. I love writing screenplays. I love writing TV. But after two years of training in the um, reduction of everything, because drama is absolutely a reduced art in which you're compacting things into these incredible moments, um, getting able, like being in a space of expansion felt so freeing and exciting. Um, and I am a very verbose person. I have so much to say. So it felt like really beautiful to get to write this way. And that led to the completion and then multiple redraftings of what turned out to be my first novel. So yeah, it was, that was my first full length novel that isn't just something I wrote after college. 
I, I love the premise of that book um, that, uh, you know, we we live in this great landscape and we have so many ideas of what uh, our our country is. And, and, you know, if you watch the news there, there's it, it's so easily for, uh, it's so easily done that 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 we all get reduced to, you know, soundbite, uh, you know, caricatures of, of who these people and people groups really are. Um, but the, the idea of seeing the, um, the land and the people, uh, on, on an extended trip is, uh, it, it, I'm, I'm sure that opened itself up to just all sorts of possibilities for you as a writer. Oh, absolutely. Um, I also think I think that's so true. And I think uh, having grown up in the sort of like East Coast elite intellectual space, um, so many people I knew never, you know, never travel in the United States. And then yeah. also there's people who exclusively travel in the United States. And, you know, all of us are missing something right um, in the sense that like the United States is beautiful and it's really easy for us to ignore how incredible and diverse it is in landscape and people. Um, but also if we only know our own country, we create really our, we create things in our mind that become very false about what what the other is like. Um, and also, I think um, one thing I was trying to explore in that that I think is sort of, you know, it's it's never not relevant is like, what do we what is our concept of immigration and of the other and how has that changed over time? And how do we kind of understand otherness and other identities and um what is our sense of like what it means to be from another place and what is our sense of identity and how we take on identities in new spaces that we come to. So America for Bringers is definitely about kind of people who find themselves at home in the United States in ways that they didn't anticipate, people who feel very alienated by the United States and people who are searching for understanding about people they feel close to and far away from through this trip. Um, but it absolutely, I think, <clears throat> reminded me of um in my research for that novel like how how incredibly beautiful the united states is and how how non-monolithic we're just so eager to create monoliths or decide what we think of other people without actually exploring it and i'm as guilty of that as anybody so i think that researching that novel um and all my novels really helps me sort of break beyond my assumptions of others which are absolutely fed by <laughs> by the news media <laughs> and it's impossible not impossible not to attach to you because it's too it's so big that it's it's helpful for us to narrowly define others as a way to like survive the world um yeah. but also very dangerous because it it doesn't lend it doesn't help us lend other people the grace i think we all need to like actually understand them absolutely your second book motherland um took a, a little different turn um I, I i know that you spent a lot of time traveling the world and and you know in interjecting yourself into uh, in, into different cultures and, and, you know, seeing the, the beauty of the world from the inside out. Um, and motherland kind of, uh, was informed by some of that world travel, wasn't it? Absolutely. Um, so I lived in, uh, India for six years, um, after I married, um, my husband uh, and um, my my husband is Indian um, and uh, um, I was integrated into this beautiful and like very accepting and wonderful Indian family as part of our marriage. Um, but living in India was also really challenging. Uh, living in Mumbai was an incredible experience and, and gave me um, wonderful platforms to explore, to travel, to explore a lot more of Asia, specifically like South, Southeast Asia. Um, but it was also like really challenging. It was really hard on me. It was hard on our, our marriage. Um, and, um, I wanted to talk about that and talk about sort of integration of family on both sides. So Motherland is about um, a woman who moves to India with her with her husband, who's Indian. And when they moved to India, to Mumbai specifically, because that is the space I had lived in. So I felt best able to write about um, and was living in while I was writing um, uh, Motherland. Uh, when, when this woman moves with her husband to Mumbai, her Indian mother-in-law decides to leave her father-in-law and comes and moves in with her new daughter. <laughs> um, her, you know, and when hilarity I tell, ensues. 
hilarity, conflict, <laughs> culture clash. <laughs> uh, but the women do forge a relationship that allows them to see their own lives and selves more clearly, uh, which for me was the focus of the book. It's funny when I tell that when I would when I was still reading that book when I would tell people in India that story, um, they would be like, okay, and then what happens? Uh, and then when I would tell you know Westerners that story, they'd be like, oh my god, what a nightmare! I can totally see what you know, like they saw the plot. You know, for Indians, it's much more common to live with your in-laws or to live with your family. So they're like, okay, when does the plot begin? Um, and so, you know, even just that difference, I think, was something I was able to integrate into redrafting that novel about like, what are your expectations for others, for family? Um, what are your expectations about, you know, sort of one of the things I think that's most frustrating and wonderful and painful about moving to other countries, especially like really big countries uh, whose cultures are really different than your own, you know, sort of dramatically, the, the groundwater of the culture is really different than your own, is that you're going to have a lot of moments, or at least I had a lot of moments where, you know, you kind of want you want the whole system to change for you. You know, like none of it makes sense to you or, or you have these sort of bad days. You have great days where you feel like you get everything and you understand everything and you feel at peace with everything. And then you have these really bad days where everything feels wrong and nothing sort of corresponds to your expectation of the world. And you just feel like all of this is wrong and it should it should be better, it should change. Um, and one of the most sort of humbling and terrible things about travel is recognizing that like, it's not wrong, you're wrong. You're the one who's wrong. You're the one who's getting it wrong. You're the one who doesn't understand. Um, no matter what your values are, no matter what you think, how you think the world should work, this whole thing works and you're the outsider looking at it and not understanding it. And I think that feeling is disquieting and humbling um, and you can grow from it, but it's also really painful, I think, uh, integrating or sort of trying to adapt um, and recognizing that some part of you probably can never really fully see this as functional or as working or as the way things should be, because some part of you wants things to work differently. And I think that's one of the pains of travel, one of the pains of living abroad, and one of the best parts of it is it challenges your assumptions of how the world should work. Um, and that can be very painful. So I think that's mostly what my, my second novel is about and very much what my life was about while I was writing it. Before we we switch gears and talk about your new book, um, After the Hurricane, I, I'm I'm noticing, um, Leah, that your, your three novels that you've written um, all come from uh, – it, 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 there's a different setting. It's a um, – there's a different cultural feel to to each of these books, um, but they they all come from you. They're all your voice, obviously. Um, when when you start thinking about a new book, um, what is that first moment of inspiration like? Uh, something I love asking people is in in one minute, a book like After the Hurricane um, doesn't exist in any form or fashion or motherland or or, or whatever the story is. And and then either you're you're thinking about a, a personal experience that you had, or maybe you're seeing uh, a, a news story on on TV or the internet, or, or you're reading something, and and it triggers a you know a um, a, a thought process, a, a, um, a a character walks onto the stage of your mind, or you think of uh, you know it's an interesting plot device, and then who could I cast this plot device with, and then. You know, in, in one form or fashion, the book does exist, and then it's your job as the writer to kind of dig that story out and brush it off and polish it up and bring it to the world. What What is that first moment of inspiration like for you? Well, first of all, I love what you just said about, like, it doesn't exist and then it does, but, like, there's still the Herculean effort of, like, excavating it. Right. Yeah. It's almost like it's almost like like when lightning strikes sand, but then you have to like dig out the glass. Yes. Oh, why is it so much work? And now it exists, but it does. It, there's sort of it speaks to like these different parts of creation, like the the inspiration and then the excavation, which I just love how you said that. That's so cool. Um, what a great way to think of that. I'm totally that's gonna haunt me forever now. Um, <laughs> You're welcome. That's that's thank free. You. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Um, oh boy, yeah, I definitely. Uh, I'm a writer who, who thus far in my career absolutely writes um, my inspiration, uh, my my flicker of inspiration, my in, initial inspiration absolutely comes from my own life. Um, 
I, my books are fiction. I definitely write um, sort of a lot of my work, I think, in writing is app is writing, creating bridges like to create, make the story farther away from my own life. I start from a very personal place and then start crafting character and situation let let allow these characters and situations to get away from me and my choices because sadly real life is not as well is not as well crafted as narrative so um you have to <laughs> make it make it better in narrative um or at least make it more interesting uh real life's a lot of waiting around um but uh i think for me um each one of my books has had different locus points of inspiration um but i think that each one of them has had a kind of like the, the process thus far at least in, in every book i've written has been something happened to me or something was said to me or some situation i was involved in or often peripherally um i wouldn't say that um i wouldn't say that for my books, there's been a like, oh yeah, this exact thing happened to me and so now I'm gonna write about it. But often there's like a conversation or a question, a question comes from a conversation or a moment or a what if X happened? There's often a like, what if X happened? You know, like this is a scenario that I've observed that's that's close to me in my life. But, and it happened like a normal scenario, like um, for Motherland, like my mother-in-law, um, my then mother-in-law came and stayed with us in Brooklyn. And I had a moment of like, what if she never leaves? What if she just stays here forever? Um, and how would I deal with that? And that was, you know, that was the spark. And then years later, I wrote Motherland. But it was like that scenario plus that question became the spark of, well, wouldn't it be cool to explore this? And by cool, I also mean very devastating because I think this would be very difficult and painful and what kind of process would this put on? And lots of other things snowballed into that of like, what will living in India be like versus living in India and how challenging I found it and all of those things and the, you know, sort of uh, stresses on my own marriage and relationship and, you know, my, my growing understanding of others. But the spark, the percolation, the, the spark of the thing that started percolating slowly underneath it all was sort of a, a scenario and a question of what, what if this could be more dramatic and interesting? Basically, I think that's probably my theater training is like to look at a very normal, banal life situation and be like, but what if there was conflict? Um, <laughs> so I think that that's been the, the primary sort of... Uh, inspiration moment that's happened in my life um, is that, you know, a lot of stuff happens in your life and you just kind of keep living. But what if you didn't, you know, what if this was the inciting incident of a film? What if this was the big moment of revelation? What if that thing changed your whole existence? And what would you do and what would happen next and next and next? And that's where it moves from like, oh, this scenario I was in that I noted into this is a fiction narrative with people who are different than I am and I can build out into um, uh, this bigger world that then can become a fictive world of characters making their own choices. Um, so for me, and I, and I, I think people obviously do this in many other ways, um, and maybe I'm deeply selfish that I get it from my own life rather than observing it in others. Although I definitely think observation is a big part of being a writer and I do like to observe others and incorporate them into my work. Um, but so far, all locus points of inspiration have been a something happened to me, a scenario or something I saw or witnessed or observed that then I just thought, but what if, what if it had become bigger and more complicated than the, the sort of sad mundanity of real life? I don't know if mundanity is a word, but I'm making it one, like I'm, Shakespeare. And, and I'm going right along with you. Yeah, I'm, so I'm with you on that. Thank you um, so much. Leah, your new book, After the Hurricane, which is out everywhere now when people are hearing this, um, who is Elena Vega? Uh, in the book or in my life? <laughs> take, take it how, however you want. Absolutely. Well, um, as I said, you know, these um, – my work does come from my life, but I would say After the Hurricane is my most personal novel to date. Um, Elena Vega, in the context of the story, is a um, a woman in her early 30s living in New York who is suddenly charged with figuring out what happened to her father, who has disappeared a couple months after Hurricane Maria. Um, he's been living in Puerto Rico, which is where his family's originally from, and he's estranged from Elena and her mother, um, and he's gone missing in this sort of couple months after aftermath. Um, and Elena, whose life has sort of drifted in some ways, 
um, she's well educated and you know has a sort of decent job that helps her survive New York uh, is also a bit adrift. She's she's ended her um, her engagement. She's dissatisfied by her work. It's not connected to her master's in history, her interest in sort of preservation. And um, she uh, goes down to Puerto Rico, a sort of, you know, hurricane rocked Puerto Rico in a couple months after the hurricane to figure out what happened to her father and to sort of sort through this historic house that her parents had renovated where her father's been living and try to figure out a little bit more about um, herself because the truth is that she's never really known much about her father. Uh, he's never shared his past with her. Um, and in discovering who he is and trying to find him, she finds new purpose in her life. Um, Elena is definitely a character who has a lot of elements of me and who's also very different uh, than I am. Um, but the the source, the inspiration for this novel is um, myself and my father and my own upbringing. Um, and so Elena is a character who's probably uh, the closest I've written to myself while still being a pretty, pretty far away from who I am and the kind of person that I am. Um, she's somebody who is sort of, has been content to be a bit of a bystander in her life um, and who is terrified of finding out who her father is, even as she sort of both because of her interest in history and legacy and because she's his daughter uh longs to know who she who he is um the nature of their relationship is one in which uh his sort of incredibly mercurial um uh tendencies as a bipolar alcoholic make it really hard for her to assert herself to get what she needs from him and yet the a lot of the book is about her reconciling the fact that there are things that we may need from people that we may never get, that we will never get. And in order to move on to live our own lives, we have to accept that and that that is the hardest with our parents because we will never stop wanting things from our parents and they may never be able to give them to us. So I think um, in many ways, I, I relate deeply to Elena. I created her um, and she <laughs> I, I gave a lot of myself to her. And I, also she is an act of fiction. Uh, so that is Elena Vega both real and not real. Do you um do you ever feel that when you put so much of yourself into a story um th well I guess let me ask it this way. Um you we we all know that there are pieces of us in in everything that we create. Some of them uh overt and some of them not so overt. Uh, some of them uh you know people would be surprised when we tell them that that this one character is more like us than than maybe the reader realizes and you know there the, the i don't i don't care what you do or who you are there pieces of, of you come out in in characters and sometimes in very surprising places um when you're dealing with with something that is so close to you and and so connected to who you are at the end of that book do you feel um satisfied that you've had uh, a bit of um a, a bit of a chance to to work through some of those feelings that that sometimes we uh we never get to to work through in life you know it's that people are, are taken too soon or you know think relationships are, are left dangling um but does does writing allow you to to get to the other side of relationships like that sometimes absolutely um, well, I should say, you know, yes and no. Uh, I think for me, um, beyond creating compelling and interesting narratives, or at least narratives I think are compelling and interesting, hopefully others do as well, uh, writing is absolutely a space to, um, to deal with, um, to deal with so many things. Um, Jose Rivera in his 36 Assumptions about playwriting uh, talks about, you know, writing writing plays, but I would extend this to writing anything as a conversation between your many selves. Um, and he goes on to talk about all the reasons that we write, what we write for. I think that's all very true. I think the conversations between my many selves absolutely um, become acts of grief, acts of joy, um, mourning, you know, I think, um, 
one through line in all my work is grief. Um, I think I think a lot about grief. I think a lot about ambiguous loss, which is a concept of um, sort of loss without end, um, which is something that people you know experience with terminal, terminally ill patients, with um, uh, parents or relatives with Alzheimer's, with um, uh, relatives who are addicts, with with anyone who 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 goes from your life without fully dying or being gone, but they're gone, but still with us. I think that that's something I'm fairly obsessed with and that writing, certainly writing um, after the hurricane allowed me to explore these different sort of edges of ambiguous grief and ambiguous loss um, in this character, which is like present in my own life and also sort of present in the book. I think the difference, I mean, there is a sense of accomplishment and joy, especially sort of you know, working through yourself in the story, I think there can also be something a little bittersweet because, you know, the story gets to end, but your life goes on. So there's a way in which you can be a little jealous of your characters. You know, they get the better crafted narrative. We get to make meaning uh, for characters in ways that like, life doesn't always hold that meaning, right? Um, narrative holds meaning. It, it has ending, it has finality. Um, and life just keeps on going. And we think we've dealt with something and then it kind of like floats back up in our lives and we think like how many times am I going to have to like mourn this say goodbye to this deal with this but character can have finality um and so I think that it's both really satisfying and like emotionally and intellectually satisfying and also sometimes I, I feel a little jealous <laughs> um of my characters that they get to move on right I get to write them an ending I think that's the difference between life and fiction right is uh life just keeps going if you're lucky um and fiction doesn't and you can write um as you said you know you can write goodbyes that you never got to have. You can write um, meaning where there was none. You can write forgiveness where you might not have any. Uh, you can write um, the, all the things you wanted to say and couldn't. Uh, so it's really satisfying, but then also sometimes I think a little jealousy inducing uh, that life isn't more like fiction. After the Hurricane is available everywhere now. When you're hearing this, go grab it uh, in in Kindle edition or audiobook uh, if you uh, if you prefer to read it that way, or uh, you know hold the paper in your hand. Or go visit your local bookstore, pick it up today. Uh, Leah, this has been so much fun chatting. Uh, if people are just discovering you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you're up to, where can they find you online? Well, um, my website, leahfrankie.com. Uh, you can also check me out on Instagram or Twitter, which is at Leah Frankie, um, or Facebook, uh, and of course, you know, wherever books are sold. Excellent. We're going to send everyone to see you and to pick up their copy of After the Hurricane. Leah, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a delight. <laughs>